Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm in my office, and I'm excited to be home for majority of September and a whole month um, in general. So it's great to be here. And I'm excited to introduce you to my friend, Alethea Irwin, who is right here. I did it correctly. She is from, she's a board member of the People's Kitchen in Philly, where she tries to do her part to fight food insecurity. Hello, my friend. Hello. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And Alethea and I know each other because we're both presidents of chapters of La Dame de Escoffier. So I'm the president of the North Carolina chapter, and she's the president of Philly chapter, Philadelphia chapter, and we just got talking on a on a president's call, right? Yes, and, and then we were in Philadelphia, and we mm-hmm. met in person, and we kind of talked about our respective um, work and the things that we do to try to help our communities. Right, exactly. So I'm excited to have you on here and to talk about the People's Kitchen. So before we get started. Let's well tell me what the People's Kitchen is first, People's Kitchen Philly, and then tell me how you got involved. Okay, so the People's Kitchen Philly is a a place where we make um, restaurant style meals um, for people in the community. We put the meals out; they are free. We don't have any requirements for people to access the meals. We also have what we call community farms, which is actually a, a form of urban guerrilla gardening. And what it is, is is that in any large city, you will find plots, empty plots of land where houses used to be. And we recultivated the land and we're growing crops there for the neighborhood. The kitchen itself, where we prepare the meals, is in the South Philadelphia section of the city. And the urban farms are in the Southwest section of the city. One of the things that happened when the pandemic occurred is, is it shut down on every restaurant overnight. And one of the things that the initial, where the initial idea came from is for two reasons. One is, is there are some woman, Aziza Young, who's very involved in feeding kids. And in Philadelphia, kids were guaranteed two meals a day at school. They got breakfast and they got lunch. And suddenly there was no school. And it, it highlighted the food insecurity that exists within our system. And her idea was to try to make, try to make food for those kids. And what they did is, is they tapped all the restaurants that closed and they got both volunteer workers from those restaurants and the food that they could no longer sell. So it was also a food rescue op- operation. Okay. The other person who was very involved in setting this up was Ben Miller, who had a space in South Philadelphia, which is where we operate the People's Kitchen out out of now. And it was called El Compadre. So so we went to El Compadre to cook. I knew Ben because my sister had done some food insecurity work with him and she dragged me down. It's, I tell people all the time, lots of times when you get one Irwin, there are actually five of us. He might end up with five Irwins, and, you know, not necessarily doing the same thing, but doing something. And, and so, so I went down with her and I cooked with her and another friend of ours. And we cooked in, I think it was eight week shifts. And we did that for a while. Wow. And then I kind of stepped back from being involved in the kitchen but they had someone who was doing the administrative work who left. And so then I, I went back to the kitchen to take a look at keeping records and seeing where we were getting our money and our feed from and trying to 
put it on an even keel so the people who were cooking could worry about cooking. And I think that's a really important task because it's, and and one of my questions is, is, is where do you get the food, right? But I mean, you can get all this food in here, but you have to, if you're going to serve it and you're going to become a nonprofit, you have to know, you have to do- have the documentation, right? Yeah. So that, and that was one of the things where the first at, at the, when the kitchen was first established, we actually operated under the LLC El Compadre doing business as the people's kitchen because, okay. you know, you have to do all of the things to become a 501c3. And that's actually one of the things that I did. We had some consultation work from the Villanova Law Project. But when I went to look at it, I realized that because we were working with law students, whenever a student left, it was almost like we were going backwards. Mm-hmm. And then talk about, you know, you get one Irwin sister, you get them all. My my sis, one of my sisters had run a, a program out of her church. And for a certain grant money, even though our church is a nonprofit, they require you to get a 501c3. And I called her up and I said, I don't understand what's going on. And she says, quit messing with those people, get the paperwork, fill it out, send it in. And I did. And we got our 501c3. And so that allowed us to... Uh, Prior to that, we had gotten community grants and we got them with a with a fiscal sponsor. Okay. And in lots of ways, fiscal sponsors are good things because when you're a small organization, you usually don't have the financial rigor you need. Right. And that's what you get when you get a, hopefully that's what you get when you get a fiscal sponsor. We had a couple of different ones and the requirements changed with the fiscal sponsor. What do you mean by that? Well, some fiscal sponsors have a whole laundry list of reporting requirements, and some of them just act as a pass. So they, okay. the money comes into them, they take whatever they charge for being your fiscal sponsor, and then they forward the money to you and they give you a 1099. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it's money that they're giving to you through that 1099 donation versus yes okay all right but big versus that you got it directly from a foundation cuz most That's foundations right. will not give you money if you don't have a 501c3 right and sometimes That's they right. use sponsorships well okay which are a lot less rigorous than um grant money right right yeah P- grant money takes a lot of extra paperwork and which is which is a good thing you you want to make sure that it's legit right yes yeah that you know and and nobody's taking trips to paris (laughs) right right exactly so okay so on that note because in a conversation that you and i had the other day because i was talking about food rescue right and food food recovery reducing food waste etc but you you get your grocery you get your food supplies mostly from grocery stores or, and I did notice on your Instagram handle today, there was a post about don't just leave it on the street for us. We need oh, to yes. track the food. So talk about that a little bit. Okay. So we get, we, we have been very wealthy. We get food from a, several different sources and we get them when they are, you know how they put those dates on food that says best, by sell yes. date. Mm-hmm. Which does not mean that there's anything actually wrong with the food. And so that's so like large grocery chains, you know, they know how people are. So for the most part, what they do is, is, is they take that food off the shelves and they donate it to us. And then the same thing happens with we get um, um, donations from um, a Small World, which is a, a fish purveyor. We get donations from some of the, the vegetable vendors in, in, we're in the South Philadelphia, which was called the Italian market. Now it's just called Ninth Street. And so that's how we get food donations. And sometimes people bring us food donations and we're not there or they didn't tell us they were coming and then they leave it on the table. And then you have a whole trash issue. <laughs> right. And oh, wow. And yeah. Some of this needs to be refrigerated. Now we do. We have partnerships with a f- several different organizations, and one of them is the um, Community Fridges in Philadelphia. And so they 
have a fridge and a pantry outside of our space where we provide the electricity for the refrigerator and both they and the people's kitchen stock the refrigerator and the pantry. Okay. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So we get food from a lot of different sources. You kind of asked if we got food rescue from caterers or from the convention Mm -hmm. center. And I explained that because we're such a small operation, we don't have the infrastructure to rescue that type of food. And also what you talked about is, is sometimes people are leery of giving you that food. Right. So I've worked worked in restaurants and I've worked in food takeout stores where, where we did things like that, where with leftover food, we would portion and freeze it Mm -hmm. and give it to other organizations that serve people in need. Gotcha. Well, and I'm hoping to have somebody on the show to talk about the Food Donation Improvement Act, which does protect us from that, but it still does need to be time and temperature controlled, like you're talking yes, exactly. about. Right? Exactly. Because we don't want to just take the food and put it on the ground outside of your place and expect to serve that, right? No. It is, so the whole, on, on your website, I kind of want to go backwards a little bit here too. On the front of your yes. website, it says, The People's Kitchen uses food to empower, transform, and heal community through free, nutritious meals, gardening, and education. And and also the word sovereignty pops up in there as well. So can you, so everything that you make is free. So you're going 100% by grants and donations, right? Yes. And and then you have, I think, what, five board members and everything else is volunteer? Okay, so actually, currently, we have eight board members. Um, okay. The five people who are on the or the executive committee. Gotcha. Three of us were, you know, original board members, and then we had some people join us. And so we have been. We don't have a program director at the moment, so the executive board has been acting as the uh, administrative arm of the organization, um, because. That's the other thing. It's like, it is very, not easy, but it is much easier to give you, get people to give you money for programs. It's very hard to get people to give you money for infrastructure or for salaries. So, so that means that you have to, you have to be able to raise money for the salary in order to pay somebody to do that full time. And so, so the, the board acts as the administrative arm and we have an account. So, you know, so that we can help people, um, Mm -hmm. you know, without falling afoul of the federal government. Right. Yeah. We don't want that to happen. So, so when we talk about, there are, there are so many things attached to food insecurity. I mean, the first one is you can't do anything if you're hungry, if you're hungry, Mm -hmm. You can't think about anything but the fact that you're hungry. You might be able to think about where can I get food, but it's not always apparent where you can get food. And the area that we service in South Philadelphia really um, encompasses a myriad of populations. There are immigrants from South America. There are immigrants from Asia. There are people who have lived in the community for years, but they... They they have they have jobs that don't pay enough to support a family. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the things one of the people said. Sometimes people just take what I think it's too much food, and I said, "Well, you're just assuming that everybody has that little nuclear family. So it's a mother and father to baby three kids." I said, "But there are households where people have six, eight, ten kids." I said, and do we want to be in the business of policing that? Right. We have tried to gather some t- statistics. So we had, we get, we got interns for some of the colleges and we have one now. And he's working on a way to gather some statistics, which is what grants and foundations love when you're asking them for money. But it's right. kind of hard to gather when you're not actually gathering data, that kind of right. data. It's like, we can tell you how many meals we put out. We can tell you if all the meals leave. We can tell you how much food we got donated and how much food left. But we can't actually say we served 
We served 150 meals and 50 of them went to children and 50 of them went to women and, you know, right. uh, they were the age range. That's the other thing. So we get people with families, but we get people. One of the one of the other big pockets of poverty are, are seniors because, and it's not that they didn't work and it's not that they don't get social security, but social security, unless you had a very high paying job, doesn't pay you a lot. And right. your social security could could literally be what your rent is. And so right. that's kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at to have food for these people so they feel like they can go out into the world and source other things. I talked earlier about, so at the beginning, because nobody was working and because all of these restaurants were, were closed, we had a large pool of workers. We had a large pool of volunteers. We now we now hire contractors to run the kitchen on a particular day. That's the chef who's in charge of the meal. We have a kitchen manager who keeps track of the other things. Okay. And one of the things that happened is is is, is that when when you know when everybody else went back to work, we still right. had to find people to cook. And so one of the things that we did is we found partnerships with like minded organizations. So there are a couple in Philadelphia. One is called Food Not Bombs. And so that's kind of their approach. Mm-hmm. It, it's right there in their name. They're saying, what, what, what should we be doing? And what we should be doing is making food, not making bombs. And the other one is right. called Hunt for Lunch. And they're, they have the slightly younger demographic <laughs> working in Egypt. And, and then we also have act as an incubator for uh, Masa Cooperativa, which is primarily women-owned and women-run organization. Mm-hmm. And I say that one of the reasons we're invested in this organization is it's because women are the people who lift children out of pro- poverty. It's like, it's, it is, if the mother's poor, the child's poor. The mm-hmm. mother could be, you know, in it and so that when you give these women the opportunity to invest in themselves and to make money for themselves, that that will circle back so that their children have have better lives. Wow. So they come and work in the kitchen. So they they have the kitchen one day a week and they actually grind and make their own masa. And then they wow. make tortillas that they sometimes sell in front of the, the kitchen and then also at a head house, which is a farmer's market in Philadelphia. Okay. All right. Well, and and that's, that's very powerful because you, in, in so many ways, because again, you said at the very beginning, and like, if you don't have food, you, you, you don't have much else, right? Because you need food to sustain yourself and you need food to feed your families. So it, it's, it's a multifaceted conversation in getting this done. And then I think even with with partnering with those other organizations, you add so much more value to the community in general across because you know, you're cross reaching different markets. markets. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, I I truly believe that. It's sort of like you can't work in a silo, but you also have to allow some grace. It's like Everybody can't do everything. Everybody doesn't have the same skill set, but almost I've watched my sister, you know, teach people who, you know, for the most part, um, we have, we have one sister. We say, what do you do for dinner? And it's like, how many sisters do you two have? I have four sisters. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I have, I have four sisters. And like I said, sometimes they get, they get gooned into doing things. And one sister works for, um, a food access program for a small nonprofit called St. Christopher's Hospital for Children. And they recently closed their office and I garnered some stuff from the the office that they were getting rid of for the people's kitchen. So then I had to get a sister to come pick it up (laughs) and drag it down to the people's kitchen. (laughs) uh, Yeah. And then the, then there were, we, I mean, we got some help from other people moving stuff, but it's, it is, you know, so it's in lots of ways how we get our food and how we get mm-hmm. other things we need, like computers and, and desks and materials and chairs and, 
is 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 that we 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 tap other organizations that are closing and lots of times people will give us things because they're closing. Right. We're not always able to take advantage of those opportunities because we run into the same problem that I said we want to run into wrestling too, which is do we have somebody available? Do we have somebody who can move it? Do we have a big enough truck to move it in? Right. Okay. Yeah. Char- charging for the actual cost of like the transportation, you know, not selling it for, you know, above fee, you know, not to make a profit, but to for selling it for the actual cost. And I guess that's clarification on does that, is the grocery store get that fee or do you get that fee? You know, how does that work? Yeah. Well, you know, so, so yeah, I don't know what I, it is actually, once you mentioned to me, one of those things I thought we could explore. Um, Mm -hmm. So with the grocery stores, some of the stores actually deliver the food to us and some of them we pick it up from. It just depends okay. on the store. It, sometimes it just depends on the day. Like, like for the most part, the grocery store delivers the food. But, you know, like with anything else, if enough people don't come to work, it's, right. it makes it harder for them to do. Right. Or, um, or if they have something that they, they know is particularly perishable, then they want to be sure there's somebody there to receive it. So we don't have the... <laughs> people left food outside. Right. Yeah. And, and that, that, I think that's part of one of the biggest problems with a lot of organizations that need, that need the food to feed the people that they're feeding is that getting the food from people, right. And the staffing. And I think that's part of what the food donation improvement act is trying to help do is to help you rescue that food. And we'll look into it more on when we're off air, but because it is, it does take gas. It does take a car. It does take people you know, to get that done. Based on what you've done in, in, in these last four years, how have you seen, what has the, been the significance to the to the community that you support and that the restaurant is in? Have you seen people prosper, prosper from it or? It is funny because you what you tend to see are the people still in need. But every mm-hmm. once in a while, you'll have somebody come up and tell you, uh, you know, what that did for them, that, you know, mm-hmm. they got food when they really needed it. It, it. it helped them, you know, we 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 sometimes get people who who used to get food volunteer in the kitchen. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I, you know, one of the things that we kind of touched on when we talked earlier is, is what, what would I like to see from people in the community? And I, and Lord knows we're never turning down dollars. <laughs> But right. I think that you don't really appreciate what the people in need and what the organization does if you don't spend a little time in the kitchen. And that's what you have to, you know, and that's the thing you have to convince people of, you know, you don't have to be a master chef. You don't have to be an extraordinary cook. If you've ever worked in a food business, one of the first things they teach you is is production. And even when I was a little kid, my father would say, if you have to do something, it's still assembly line, even if you're the only person on the assembly line. Oh, and that's he so says, true. He says, so, you, you, you know, you should, you if you got to cut mm-hmm. up onions, you should cut up all your onions, not just cut up enough for the, you know, the, the one thing. You cut up enough for the 10 things. So, right. So, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's a good point. <laughs> Yeah. And people never think about it. It's like you think about the way that you learn to cook, not about the way you have to cook where you're cooking for a hundred people. Right. Right. And, Cause, uh, right. Cause it, whether it's 10 or a hundred, it's the same steps. And you kind of, you know, you kind of want to do those steps that will, will make it the quickest way for you to get to get to your final projects. Right. And and then, you know, one of the things that we try to do is, is when we make food is make food that kind of reflects the different cultures that exist in that neighborhood. Okay. So, you know, foods with Asian accents and South African accents. And like I said, it was originally the Italian market. So and so and and 
even at home, my my sister Valerie and I had a restaurant. It was called Ichi Girl. And she was the chef at the restaurant. But when we were home, one of us would take out food. And if the other one got home first, they would cook. And we, it would be the same food. And I would come home and, you know, she would have made some Asian a- accented di- dish where I was just pr- planning to put a rub on it and stick it in the oven. You know, it's <laughs> like, if, you, know, you know, it's like it would be the same food, but we would look at it and see totally different things. And that's what we try to do when we make food at the kitchen is, is not fall into the habit of making food that's significant to you, but to, to always try to make food that's significant to the wider community. Well, yeah, because it's your, I mean, you may be eating it, but it's really about the people that you're feeding, not you. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How, what, what challenges have you had over the course of the four years? The biggest, I mean, you've kind of talked about getting new equipment in from other companies that are closing it, et cetera. But what are your biggest challenges, you know, on a daily basis? Is it collecting food from those grocery stores or have you built a relationship with them enough that they automatically do that? I think we have a good enough relationship with them that we that we get food like that. There are also um, other avenues through which we get um, food. It, um, the food distribution center in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. you know, they literally have a place where they have overage where you can go up and pick up food because they like, you know, I'm talking about working in a restaurant. When you work in a restaurant, you try to keep your margin as tight as possible and you try not to order food that you can't use well the the food distribution center has that same problem but on a much larger scale and some weeks you you think you might need you know 400 tons of bananas and what you only needed was 20 tons of bananas and we're not the only people that benefit from that probably almost all the food rescue operations in philadelphia benefit from that but it, it is um, certainly a way to keep, it's not just a way to feed people, it's a way to make sure that food is used and we're not contributing to food waste. It is a sad thing where we're throwing away food and people are going hungry. Mm-hmm. And so that's, so so we have gotten good partners in helping us rescue that food. That's uh, that's a really really good point, and I wish there were venues that didn't believe oh we're we're going to get sued for donating this food or whatever. I mean, if it's still good, if it's still time and temperature controlled, then we should be feeding our communities. Yes, we should be feeding our communities. We, you know, people talk about what a wealthy nation this is, and still there are so many in inequities, and mm-hmm. and and I I think you know. The fact that you don't have food or housing or, you know, is is way up there. It's it's funny. I I should I should memorize this woman's name. I have it. But there was an obituary in the Times earlier this week for a woman who started English as a second language. And uh-huh. when she started it as a reading program, she read something where she thought there were people in other countries who didn't know how to read. And then a census came out and she realized there were people where she lived that didn't know how to read. And she literally started it in her basement. And then she expanded it to um, include, you know, she, she got people from churches and people from, you know, teachers. She got a whole cadre of people and she started to teach people how to read. And then the organization grew and it merged and became another organization. And, and, and it's just, it's just amazing. She was 107 when she died. Wow. So, so sometimes you feel as if, as one person, you can't do anything, mm-hmm. but anything you do helps. You know, any okay. contribution you're willing to make, whether it's time or money, or sometimes it's an idea. You know, just because we have a way of doing things does not necessarily mean it's the best way. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes you have to adjust what you do and how you do it because you can better serve your population. 
Right. There's so many things in that that I want to break down. And oh, my friend Katie just looked it up. Lynn Hygien. Hygienian. Hygienian? Oh, no. Anyways, we'll look up that name. Yeah. Because she said she was 107 when she died. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I was just telling telling somebody. You think that's a good age until you hit 106. (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. Like there's a bunch of people who were like the oldest people in the world that are just recently dying and they're that age. Like, holy moly. We've talked about this at the very, very beginning, but I want to just ask this question very poignantly. Here she is. Ruth Johnson Cole. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Champion of literacy. How does food play in empowering and transforming the community, especially during the crisis? Oh, I well, I I think I think it did two things. It gave it gave people a space in which they could get food. It gave them a space, a sense of community, a sense of being tied to the other people. So. Sometimes when you're food insecure or anything, or if you're housing insecure, you feel like you're alone. You feel like there's nobody who understands what you're going through. You feel like people think you must have done something wrong to be in that situation. And when you meet other people who face those same challenges, you realize that that circumstances can shape what happened to you just it's 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 not all dependent on your choices. I mean, the pandemic, in addition to highlighting how food insecure people in the United States are, because you know this is not a, a problem that is is only exists in Philadelphia. It's it exists across the country. It exists in cities. It exists in small towns. It ex- exists in rural areas. And what we've we've become. I think in lots of ways, such a consumptive society that we live that paycheck to paycheck and Mm -hmm. people who, who are more, more income secure don't realize that we've, we've created this system Mm -hmm. where people barely make enough to pay their bills. And in some instances they can't pay their bills. And I think, I think when you're not alone, when you, see other people, then you start thinking about what things you can do to, to change that. And one of those things is, is is that when the people volunteer in the kitchen or when um, this world started opening up, up again, um, using the contacts that the people who worked in the kitchen had to help these people um, find work. Of course, there was, then there was the other problem we ran into is, is because a lot of them were undocumented. And that 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 causes you know challenges. It it we have so many issues around immigration. It's it's amazing. And one of the ones that I'm always telling people is 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 that until they made it so hard to cross the border from Mexico to the United States, people didn't come and stay. They used to come, go home, and they might come back. But they didn't come, but but now they're afraid to leave because they can't get back in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so 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 I, you know, Lord knows I don't have the answer, but I do think that I was just talking to my. I think we need to give people a little more grace. Mm-hmm. I think almost on every level, we don't we don't we don't give them grace if they or if they're if they're laboring in hardship. So, yeah, so so when we're talking about that, it's sort of like the gardens. At the gardens, we have a group working there who used to garden in a plot in South Philadelphia, and they grow food that um, is reflective of their culture. So like mm-hmm. squash and winter melon and eggplants and special herbs. And and that that's the other thing you're trying to give people. You're trying to kind of cement their self, their sense of self and home. You and I think that's empowering that, you right. know, I think in lots of ways, it used to be that people had to kind of give up their culture if they were in the United States, you know, you know, everybody right. spoke English, everybody, everybody was, I had to, had to learn the food that was 
served here and not the food that they 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 had in their country of origin. But one of your friends that make the corn, Mohi, Mo, how do you say it? Mohi Masala. Did I say that right? Yeah. No? <laughs> yeah. I probably don't call them that. So it's like. Well, yeah. no, that what's that organization that you work with that make that comes and does the. Oh, the Masa Cooperativa. Okay. Maybe that's not the same group. Okay. Because they. Yeah. yeah. They just posted on here. Yes. We need to be more empathetic to all humans. So I need to make sure it's the same group that you were talking about earlier. But anyways, Mohi Masala is thank you very much. They put it in they put it in Instagram for me to know how to say it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. But you know, one of the things somebody said to me on a podcast, and there's two podcasts from previous things, is one created a kitchen for people because when they come over, the only thing that they know how to do is show you their food, right? People talk people share their food with each other, right? And so they gave them a kitchen so that, you know, the immigrants from wherever they were could actually make the dishes of their native country that they knew how to make, right? And so it gave them that space and and that organization gave them the empathy to to learn and, and teach that. So it's amazing, it's amazing that you're allowing that to happen, right? And we need to understand their cultures and understand who they are while we're still making food for them. I hope that made all sense. <laughs> yeah, it does make sense because it is, it is very easy to get focused on the task and, and forget the people, you know, it, it harks back to what I was talking about earlier when you want everybody to have a chance at the food, but do you want to police it to the point that you make people feel self-conscious mm-hmm. about taking it? And that's not what you want to do. You want everybody to feel as if they're worthy of that food. Mm -hmm. Yep. They just said shared food is love. And so actually they're an Indian spice blend company based in Philly. You guys need to chat. Okay. We certainly (laughs) do. Yeah. Because you have to sitting down and, and breaking bread with somebody, you know, it is such an empowering and heart filled opportunity to make a new friend, break down barriers. And I think there was a story recently that I read about people, you know, it was two people from the from the opposite sides of the current war, you know, sitting down and having a conversation with each other over food, right? And, yes. and it, it didn't impact their, you know, they got to share their own perspectives of the war, but they didn't walk away like, beating each other up, right? They walked away with this this conversation that they had in learning the other person's perspectives. Yeah, it's like, you know, it is it is very much that food is a connector. And and it is it is an always interesting thing when you have food from other cultures and when you hear people talk about their food. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I didn't mention in that is, is, is that last year and this year, uh, we participated in, in a, a community building exercise that was, that involved other organizations that were in food rescue. And they had a big dinner where, you know, different chefs made and or donated food. So people would get a chance to see the different things. And, and yes, it is very, it's very important to share food. It's very important to talk to people about the food. And, and I will confess that sometimes when I'm down there trying to do pe- paperwork and people knock on the door, it's like the door is shut because I'm trying to work. <laughs> but they, but you know, and then they say, well, do you have any food? And I say, well, let me check because that's not really what I do. You know, and sometimes that we have one day where we don't actually have anybody cooking, but the people who cook the day before or early in the week try to make extra meals so we can just put them out. And so, and that's, and that's a challenge. Like when it's really hot, then you want to make food that's not, is, 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 is cold. But when it's really cold, it's more of a challenge because you really want to put out hot meals. You know, you want, you want the meals to meet the season. And that's actually mm-hmm. one of the things that we get. Lots of times we get produce and fruit and things that are very seasonal. Right. Well, and which is more nutrient dense, hopefully, than getting it from somewhere else in the world, right? Um, yes. 
And you're supporting that local community too. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, it's, it, I think sometimes we forget how interconnected we all are that no matter where you fall on that social, economic, educational spectrum, the things you want are you want to be able to feed your family. You want to be able to um, live in peace. You want to be able to, you know, have some place to live. It's like, Mm -hmm. and and you want, and you want a community around you that, that um, embodies that, those values. That's very true. Very, very true. Okay. Two final questions for you. Okay. What looking ahead, what, what is the, what is the people's kitchens goal? And how can people support you to, and get involved to support the mission? Okay, so there, you know, I've said it earlier, there are two things. One is, is we're never turning away volunteers and we're certainly never turning away dollars. And if you have some ideas or you're interested in becoming more involved, um, kind of what we're trying to do right now is set up a better infrastructure for the people's kitchen so that we can have advisory boards and advisory committees because I think, um, you know, the many hands, less work, um, kind mm-hmm. of thing. And also, so the vision doesn't change, but how you implement the vision changes because you have to adjust it to what's available and what the times are like and where the resources are. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we are. It's one of the reasons why we've been trying to grow our board. And it's one of the reasons we're always looking for people with a particular skill set. So... You know, right now we have our board consists of the the one of the founders who is very involved with the community farms, Ben Miller, and mm-hmm. my my sister who is a chef and a food justice advocate, April McGregor, who is also someone we know from Les Dom, who's a uh, food she does canning and preserving, and and she kind of when we have overages like things that we can't cook right away. She takes care of turning that into something that we can have in our pantry and like awesome. use later in the year. Yeah. Right. It, it is very, we have um, Pete who's an artist and had been involved in the food business and does a lot of our grant writing. And so, 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 you know, but as we, as we grow, as we look to refine our vision, cause we're, we're, we're about to have a board retreat. We've been trying to do this for a while because I've, I, I know you found this with Lay Dom. I found this with Lay Dom too. It's like you kind of get stuck in the minutia of the work and not the vision for the organization. Mm-hmm. And that's an important thing. That's, that's also the kind of thing that when you're going to funders, they want to know. They're like, I'm giving you this money, but it, what happens when this money runs out? Are you are you are you looking for somebody else to give you money or are you looking for like one of the one of the things we're trying to do is come up with a sustaining donor campaign that'll cover our fixed costs. So the things like um, rent, electricity, gas, water, those things mm-hmm. are never going away. Right. And like I said, funders don't want to pay for that. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's uh, so okay. that's one of the things. Yeah. No, I, that's, that's such an important thing to think about because just like I said, you know, collecting the food, picking up the food that, that takes people to go get it. It takes cars, but so does keeping the doors open. It takes the electricity, the water, the knives, you know, those, the pots and pans, you know, et cetera. Yeah. It takes all of that to make sure you stay afloat and continue to do what you're doing. All right. So my last question, which is what I ask everybody and I, I liked your answer when I asked you, you know, previously, but what does a safe, sustainable and inclusive food and beverage experience look like or feel like to you? So it, it is very much, I think, when you kind of you have to ask people about what they're looking for and you have to listen to the answer because sometimes and I do it, I know I do it a lot. And my friend complains about it. It's, it's like you're trying to be so helpful that you're jumping to the answer. Mm-hmm. And so you're not actually hearing what people say. I, I 
one of the other things I think you asked about is, is that had I ever had a bad food experience? And I eat out a lot and my, you know, depending on who you're talking to that day, I might be perceived as picky, but I, I do tell people that I'm allergic to things, but some things I never, I, I don't tell people I'm allergic to because like there's this elaborate description of the food and then I get it and it's got strawberries in it. And I'm, I'm allergic to strawberries and I have not had, I've had a reaction. I've had not had an anaphylactic shock reaction, but thankfully that's, yeah. that's that thankfully, but that's the kind of thing you have to l- listen to when people tell you, we had someone come into the restaurant when we were, when we tried it and order shrimp and grits and then say to me, she was allergic to shrimp. It's like, Oh, you okay. can't have this. <laughs> it's like, now if she had kept that to herself, but when you tell me that I can't serve you food like that, mm-hmm. and I have another sister who has a whole series of food challenges, and I said two things to her. She said she couldn't eat out. I said, "No, you have to read the menu differently." And it is, and that's a, that's kind of what it is. It's like so she reads the menu the way they give it to her. So she can't have pasta, or she can't have flour pasta. We eat pasta, mm-hmm. but. If there's rice or potatoes on the menu, that's generally an easy substitution. Mm-hmm. But you have to say, I'm not the crazy, you know, because sometimes you think it's just a crazy person who wants to rewrite the entire menu. You say, right. I'd really like to have this, but I can't have pasta. And usually people are accommodating. And, and so, so that when we make food at the kitchen, for example, lots of times we try to make food that can be served both as a vegetarian or vegan dish, that we could put some meat or fish or shrimp, some protein, some other type of protein on. So Mm -hmm. people don't feel like we're only catering to the vegetarians and the vegetarians don't feel like we're never having food for them. Right. (laughs) That is a real thing. That is a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I love, I absolutely love what you're doing and I love with the people's kitchen and I need to come up in Philly and, and work with you in the kitchen one day. Cause I do, I do agree with you that once you get in that kitchen, instead of just handing dollars over, if you get in there and you experience what the, the meaning behind making the food is and then serving it as well, you know, yeah. it, it adds a whole nother level. Yeah, I believe so. And I believe I believe that, you know, you're having these conversations also helps with opening up that space. Right. Yeah. Well, Alethea, thank you very much for you're being very here. You're very welcome. And be sure to let me know when you have the person talking on, on about the Food Donation Protection Act, because I will. I really want to ha- hear that because. Okay. Will, and I'm going to put a link in here too under comments with the, an article on it, which is from the Center for Health law and policy innovation at Harvard Law School. Okay. Um, so I just put that link in there um, for everybody to look at. But yeah, I'm going to talk about that. And there's been a lot of conversations around food waste in general. And I know the White House just put out a national strategy for d- reducing food waste, food loss and waste and recycling organics that came out in June. So I want to have a conversation on that too. That's so, interesting. But you know what you said that and it made me think of something else, which is not exactly about it is about food insecurity and mm-hmm. one of the one of the really big problems we have in the food insecurity space is is the food stamp program doesn't mm-hmm. allow people to use it to buy hot food oh and okay. yes and the assumption attached to that is that you have a kitchen and right. some place to heat food mm-hmm. so i can buy a cooked chicken but I can't buy it hot. I have to buy it cold. Yes. And, and, and well, part of it is you couldn't buy a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store that just came out of the oven. You can't buy a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store. that just came out of the oven. Now here, here's the, here's the thing. They both cost the same amount of money. Right. And it is really, you will find cashiers who will say, well, I didn't know it was hot and just ring it up <laughs> the same, <laughs> but yeah, but one of my, what the, the sister who works with the foundation says that it's because the food stamp program was, is a 
agricultural department program, mm-hmm. and it was made to help the farmers, not to help the starving people. Right. Yep. And and I was just actually listening to a podcast episode from Food Tank about that, and because uh, the food co- or the food bill, the farm bill is up for renewal, and there's a lot of things that need to be that are being addressed in the farm bill, which oh, impacts. That would be great. Yeah, which impacts that, and and actually, I, I have to look it up. But he said that they want it, the current House version of it is taking thirty billion dollars out of that program. Right, which is the opposite of what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Yeah. Yeah. It's the opposite of what we want to do. We want to put more money in there, right? And build, feed people, not build bums, or however you said that, right? Yeah. Um, Let me, because I was just listening to it in the car yesterday, and it was a great interview that she had. I'll find it and put it in the chat for everybody after we're done. Because I just, I thought it was a really good conversation of food tank. I'll find it anyway. Yeah, I'll find okay. it. Because it, it, it does talk about that. So we do need to, when you're voting for people and you're looking at stuff, and if you're concerned about feeding people, you mm-hmm. need to be paying attention to what the farm bill says. And if it if it goes through this time or if it's going to get pushed off to the next one, because we owe what have 70 days until... You know, or something. Like it's, that. Yeah, it's In like the election. Yeah, yeah. it's so. that's going to be interesting. Exactly. All um, right, my friend. Know, Go ahead. You. I was just going to say the the well, Dom had planned something for the tenth, but we're removing it because the debate is here in Philadelphia at the Constitution Center. Oh, and I and they have not. I I I guess you have to murder somebody to get a ticket because they haven't even mentioned a lottery for tickets. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. That would be interesting to watch for sure. So in yeah. person, especially. All right. Well, I put okay. up here how to get a hold of you. This is their Instagram feed, People's Kitchen Philly. Get a hold of Alethea. And then actually, here is their website as well. So if you're in Philly, and please reach out to them and go spend some time in the kitchen with them. Chef Anzer and Silver Lining Singers, and I'm going to say this right, Moji Masala. Thank you for joining on and on Instagram, Real or Kashima as well. I really appreciate you being here. And everybody stay safe and eat well until next time. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrat, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrat.com and If you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.